But one of the things that I desire as pastor is I desire that when we read the word, we understand what we're reading. And so many times we are reaching a book, we're reaching a chapter, and we'll grab a verse and we'll read that verse not understanding the context of what was happening, who it was written to, why it was written, or what was going on. So as we walk through Romans, um, just, just a quick review here. Um, we started um, um, in chapter 1, and we walked through, through 1 through 8. And 1 through 8 is really about faith, and they're doctrinal chapters. And so 1 through sin, we talked about the most complete diagnosis of sin um, that you're probably going to find in the scripture um, as we walk through chapters 1, 2, and 3. And then we talked through chapters 4 and 5 about salvation. Now listen, Romans is important to every believer. You need to understand Romans because there are some things if you don't understand with Romans, you won't understand with end times, you won't understand with up times or down times. Then we talked about 6 through 8, we talked about sanctification. We talked about for a person, when we get saved, um, we're justified. We have justification. We're free from hell. Then we talked about the second part of salvation is sanctification. And that's when we're free from the power of sin. And then we talked about the third part is glorification, where we're free from the presence of sin. We need to understand that. The reason that that's so important for a Christian is if a Christian doesn't understand those three parts, if they sin, and they think the sin is bad enough, they'll think they're not saved anymore. But how many of you know your babies don't come out walking? If they do, you think something wrong with them. If they walk too early, you think something wrong with them. Amen. But we're, 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 we're work in progress. Um, and then we started in on chapters 9. Chapters 9, 10, 11, those are chapters of hope, and it's about dispensational chapters. And so 9, 10, 11 talks about, it talks about Israel's past, Israel's present, and Israel's future. And we've completed talking about Israel's past and Israel's present. And as we get into 11 tonight, I pray we can make it all the way through 11. We're now talking about Israel's future. Why is Israel's future imperative for a Christian to know? It's imperative that we as Christians understand What's going on with the Jews? Why they're in the shape they're in? How is it that the Jews, what's going on with them, how does it impact us? And so if you don't understand these things, you'll go through the Bible thinking the whole Bible is about the church. How many of you know there are 66 books in the Bible? The church was born in Acts and the New Testament. 43 books had already been written before the church was born. The entire Bible is not about the church. So when you read it, I want to make certain that you keep it in perspective. And if you look in Revelations, when the, the, the Greek term for the harpazo, when the rapture happens, the church is going to be taken. So the church was born supernaturally, and the church is going to be taken supernaturally. And let me tell you what that means. That means you have a one hour long test you're taking. And when 55 minutes gets there, the teacher says, stop. I'm going to give you a period of grace. Now that period of grace may last 30 minutes or two days. The teacher says, but when I throw this red flag down, your last five minutes start. And so if you don't understand about the church, when the church gets up out of here, some things are going to happen as it pertains to time. And so I want you to understand that as we talk about the Jews, and especially as we talk about some of this tonight, that you get it and you understand. The things that happened to the, to the Jews when they rebelled against God and turned their back on God, God never took those promises from them. He didn't. It's like the prodigal son. When the prodigal son left home, he went through a lot of mess. But when he came back home, daddy was still daddy. And so when you understand the scripture, when you really understand the scripture and the word, things make sense. You don't have to go to church and just run into walls and fall out because things make sense. Now, ain't nothing wrong with running into walls if you're shouting. <laughs> ain't nothing wrong with shouting. But I want you to understand what you're shouting about. So let's jump into Romans chapter 11. 
So Romans chapter 11, it says, I say then, had God cast away his people, talking about the Jews, God forbid, for I also am an Israelite, the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. So many churches, so many pastor, pastors, they believe that since Israel, God's chosen people, turned their back on God, that God is done with them. Well, this is, this is, you know, the position of a lot of Christians. But listen, people will say that Israel forfeited the things that God promised to them, and they now belong to the church. That is not true. The things that God promised to Israel, they are for Israel. What he promised to the church, he promised to the church. Now, Abraham was an Israelite and of the tribe of Benjamin. Abraham was an Israelite tribe of Benjamin. King Saul was of the tribe of Benjamin. And notice what Paul said here. He's of the tribe of Benjamin as well. He's a Jew. He's an Israelite. And so really what's happening here in this scripture is, it's a rhetorical question. He's saying, had God cast away his people? It says, God forbid. He said, God, if God had cast away his people, he didn't cast away me too. So let's go on to number two. It says, verse two and three, it says, God had not cast away his people, which he foreknew. It said, what ye not, what the scripture said to Elijah, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they kill thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. Now, he's quoting here from 1 Samuel. You remember, uh, um, um, let me say this. The scripture says here, who God foreknew. That means to have knowledge beforehand. That means to have a meaningful relationship. God chose Israel as his covenant people from eternity past. And he entered into a relationship with this. And let me say this. As a nation, Israel is the only nation on the planet that has a relationship with God. All us and other nations, we have relationships, but as a nation... They're the only nation that have a relationship with God. See, the church can get conceited real quick. And if people don't teach us the word, it'll make us think that we're something that we're not. We know we're the righteousness of God. We know we made the image, image, his image and all of that. But we need to understand how God made the Israelites. We need to understand the covenant that he entered into. And listen, he's not done with them. He's not done. And so remember Elijah. You remember he was convinced that he was the only one left. You know, he was on the run from Jezebel, and he said, I'm the only one left. Everybody else that bowed their knee, what did the Lord tell him? Verse 4, he said, but what said the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Wow. God was not limited to one scared prophet. He was scared, and, and, and so... What is the point here? The point here is this. God always has a remnant. He has a remnant. He always, he always, he always has a remnant. So even though the Jews at large, they have turned their back on God, he still has a remnant of them who, who have not. I don't know a master builder like, like God. So verse 5 says, even so then at this point, this present time also, there is a remnant According to the election of grace, even today, you may not realize this. Y'all know everything and any and everything under the sun happens in Hollywood, right? But God has a remnant. He got a remnant that's not going to bow. On Capitol Hill, some folks sit out to call it Lion Hill. God has a remnant. God always has a remnant for himself. I don't care how wicked and how bad things get. God is smarter than us. Because let me tell you why. Nothing sneaks up on him. Nothing sneaks up on him. So in every generation of the church, a remnant chosen by grace, they've been called out from amongst the Jews. 
So even though the Jews are in the current position that they're in, they're rebelling, they never received Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they don't believe he's the Messiah, God still has a remnant. Let's go on to verse 6. And if by grace, then it is to no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is to no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Y'all, they're not speaking in tongues there. They're not. So Paul stated that this choice is totally by God's grace. And I want you to understand something. Grace and works, there is a difference. There is a difference. Grace and works. Grace, when you receive something by grace, we're saved by grace. That means it's of no works of your own. That's grace. And so isn't it interesting that the, that the Jews kept trying to be justified in the face of God by their works. But then here we come, the heathens, with faith. So understand that, 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 that if you make grace works, it ain't grace no more. <laughs> Says, Tracy, I got a free gift for you. She come up here and give it, get the free gift, and then she give me $25. It ain't free. And so people will tell you that if you miss it, you lose your salvation. Well, what did I do good to get it? If I can do something wrong to lose it, what did I do good to get it? It's not based on your works. That's what make it, that's what make it so amazing in the life of, of us who were brought in through faith because the Jews, God's chosen folk, oh my God. Let's look at verse 7. What then? Israel had not obtained that which he seeketh for. Israel had not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election had obtained it, and the rest were blinded. What does this mean? Israel sought God and couldn't find him. Why? Because it was they tried to find him based on works. They tried to find him based on works. Listen, you may not realize this, but you can't strive to find God. He has to reveal himself to you. Do y'all hear me? Y'all remember when Saul was on, uh, 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 riding on the Damascus Road? He was doing all he could to, to persecute everybody. But all of a sudden, here comes, here comes the Lord. And remember when the light struck him from the horse? Instantly, Lord, Lord. <laughs> Wait a minute now. What are you doing? Call on the name of the Lord. God has to reveal himself to an individual. And so my thing is, the Jews who were looking for him by works couldn't find him. But the Gentiles who were not looking for him found him by faith. That just messes some folk up. The Jews were looking for him based on their works, and the Gentiles were not. And keep in mind, he found us. Verse 8 says, according to as it is written, God had given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see. And ears that they should not hear unto this day. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You remember when we studied Romans chapter 1? When it talked about those that refused to accept God, refused to acknowledge him in creation. You remember the scripture says that God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Notice the devil didn't give them over to a reprobate mind. God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Here, it's talking about the Jews. It says God gave them over to the spirit of slumber. What it means is to be hardened, hardened, seen from Paul, from, from his explanation, it, it was hard for them to actually see. They were hardened. They had the spirit of slumber. And, 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 and so what we find here is Paul is quoting from Deuteronomy 29 and Isaiah 29, and it indicates that the hardening that God gave them was like a spiritual drowsiness. Well, pastor, I don't understand. Go let somebody give you some anesthesia. And what happens instantly? You just pass out. Even when you come back around, you're drowsy and it takes you a minute. What happened to the Jews was God gave them a spirit of slumber. I didn't say it. The scripture said it. He caused them to enter. Now, 
there's a reason why God did this. Look at verse 9. And David said, let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back always. Quoting from Psalm 69. What you will find is, as David is writing, and remember, David is not writing to the church at Rome. He's writing to believers in households in Rome. But notice, almost everything he says, he's quoting from the Old Testament. <laughs> Most people don't want to teach you the Old Testament. Everything in the Old Testament has been fulfilled. The, the, the New Testament was in the Old Testament concealed. The Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. Every time Jesus opened his mouth, quoting the Old Testament. Every time Paul wrote, he's quoting the Old Testament. But now he's making certain that you understand it. Because I need you to hear something. When they wrote the scripture in the old days, in the, in, 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 in the, in the Old Testament, they didn't always understand what they were writing. I think it's 1 Peter 1.21 says, Prophecy in old time came not by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. They didn't fully understand what they were writing. They just wrote what they were told. And in the New Testament, there's no scripture of private interpretation. So let's look at this. So what is happening here is the prediction of what would happen to them, uh, um, to, the, to the Jews. But it became an occasion for their rejection of God. A snare, a trap, a stumbling block. And let me read to you what Romans 9, 32 through 33 says. You're just two pages over. Turn back to Romans 9. Romans chapter 9, look at, we're going to look at verses 32 and 33. It says, wherefore, because they saw it not by faith, but as it were by works of the law, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone, as it is written, behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Notice who the stumbling stone is, Jesus. And the Jews had a problem with who? Jesus. And then it talked about the tables of their heart, that their, let their tables be made a snare. Let their blessings from the hand of God, let it be made a snare to them. And, 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 and listen, to bow down their back because they receive, they refuse to receive God's truth. Now listen, there's a scripture that says the curse causeless will not come. The curse caused less will not come. And so what you see here happening to the Jews is because they reject it, they refuse Jesus, they turn their back on God, and now something is happening to them. A whole spirit of drowsiness has come upon them. Now these are God's chosen people, but all of this is happening to them. Let's look at verse 11. I say then... Have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather, through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Listen, y'all, they have stumbled, but they are not falling. Are you with me? That's why when people teach a replacement theory that everything God had for the, 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 the children of Israel and the Jews is for us. That's not true. The scripture says here that they will stumble, but they will not fall. The stumbling served for two divine purposes. What are those two purposes? Let's look at the scripture. It says, God forbid, but rather through their fall, what happened? It's come unto Salvation is coming to the Gentiles. <laughs> their fall, because of their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles. That's one reason. You can look at Ephesians 2 and 11 through 13 on that one. And then number two, to make Israel envious. 
to provoke them to jealousy. Because you're God's chosen people. Oh, yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. You're God's chosen people. They saw the hand of God all through the Old Testament, even as they left and went through the Red Sea and came to the walls of Jericho. And folk had heard how God's hand was upon them. But all of a sudden now, since they rebelled against God, he's called a drowsiness or sleepiness to come on them. And now it looks like he has a new chosen people. Who? You and me. So the scripture said that this came upon them so salvation could come to the Gentiles. See, you just don't get that when you read Romans just like that. And I want us to understand that. That's why this great salvation that we have, that Jesus paid for, they hung him high, they stretched him wide. There's a whole lot that goes into that. Verse 12 says, Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more the fullness. What is this scripture saying? It's saying if we're blessed by their stumbling, how much more will we be blessed when they are restored? How many of you thank God for restoration? I thank God for restoration. So the scripture is saying here, if we're blessed because of their stumbling, how much more blessed will be we be when they are restored. And let me say this. They will be coming into their fullness. Notice what it says here. It says, now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. They will come into their fullness. They will come in, the Jews will come into their fullness. And this is what I need you to understand. I need you to understand that there are certain events in, throughout time in the Bible that happen that cause other things to happen. For example, before the salvation came to the Jews, this is what happened to the Gentiles, this is what happened to the Jews. And that drowsiness came upon them. And y'all know what? Isn't it interesting for a drowsiness to come upon you? And 2,000 years later, you're still drowsy? But the Bible says here, plain as day, God still has a remnant. Now, in the modern day church, this is not what we like to teach. We need to educate. Let's go on. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I, the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. Listen, Paul was passionate for his countrymen, the Jews. He was passionate for them, but he was called to the Gentiles. Isn't it interesting, the thing that you're passionate to, God called you to something else. How many of you know it's better to go on and do what God tells you to do than what you want to do? Y'all know that, right? And so he was passionate. You remember he said in, in it was chapter 8 that, that, that if he could just give up himself and die so they could get it. He was passionate. But he knew God called him to the Gentiles. Now, Peter was called to the Jews. Peter was called to the Jews, and Paul was called to the Gentiles, and Paul wished it had been the other way around. But one of the reasons I believe Paul was called to the Gentiles, remember what he was doing before he was called? He was out messing up the church, he, right? And so his misery became his ministry. And so the other thing here, uh, um, um, Paul affirmed his position he made it plain. He was writing to Rome. He made it plain that I am called to the Gentiles. Now, let me tell you this. He tried a few times to go do his thing with the Jews. <laughs> they ran his rump off. Stay in your grace. Stay in your grace. We laugh sometimes and we, we say that means if you, are, if you know you are an anointed usher, stay at the choir stand. They had a quiet stand. But, but, but what am I saying? I'm saying know what God has called you to. And notice, what, now, and I need you to get this, the Apostle Paul wrote three-fourths of the New Testament. He knew what he wanted to do, but he had to be obedient to what God told him to do. 
That's a lesson for all of us. Verse 14, it says, if by any means I may provoke the emulation to them which are my flesh, it might save some of them. Paul was hoping that by the growth and the desires of the Gentile, that some of the Jews might be saved. That's basically what he said. He's saying, I'm, I'm writing to the Gentiles, I'm called to the Gentiles, but I'm hoping that because of the fact that they are growing, that they are growing in grace, they're growing in the knowledge of God, that the Jews will see them, and it'll cause the Jews to live better. How many of you know your life should impact your family? It's amazing that if some people, everybody, I said it in the, in the message the other Sunday, everybody want to go witness but the Bible told us to be a witness. We want to go preach. He said, just listen, just shine. Listen, just let it shine. Because see, if I, if I, if I was a scound booger, showing up scound booger, and then the Lord changed me, and when I show up now, and I'm a minister of grace, I ain't got to quote no scripture to you. Because see, when I leave, they're going to be saying, you think he real? I heard he was. They told me they left some money on the table, and he didn't even get it. See, that's what we need to make certain that we do. Okay, let's go on to verse 15. Um, it, says, it says, for if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? The Amplified says this, for if their present rejection of salvation is for the reconciliation of the world to God, what will their acceptance of salvation be but nothing less than life from the dead? Because they rejected God, it allowed the Gentiles to come in. And he's basically saying, so when they turn back to God, oh my God, what will happen there? You remember I told you, I think before Christmas, as we were studying, when you study Isaiah 53, he was wounded, for our transgression, bruised for our iniquities. That scripture is a prophetic scripture for when the Jews come in. We use it, we quote it, we sing it, and it's good. But that's a prophetic scripture because they are coming in. But that scripture is prophetic for when they come in. And I'm going to tell you something. They're going out. They're disappearing to a degree. Cause us to come on the scene. But you're going to see here in a second our disappearing is going to cause them to come back on the scene. Are you with me? For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. Two illustrations here from Numbers 15. So when the children of Israel, when they entered Canaan, they were told after their first wheat offering, their first wheat harvest, that they were to take some of the wheat, and make the bread and offer it up to the Lord. And so what it symbolized was they took the first that they had and they made it and they presented it to the Lord. And because they presented it to the Lord, it caused all the rest of it to be blessed. Are y'all with me? You know how the Bible tells us to bring our first fruit? Well, 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 they made a cake and they were presented. And so the cake that was made from it it, 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 it was sanctified or made holy by being offered to God, which calls the balance. And look at verse 17. And if some of the branches, if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, I said, Pastor, what are you talking about? How many of y'all thinking it? Amen. It says, and if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in amongst them, and with them partake it of the root and the fatness thereof. Paul's second illustration was that of a tree. The first one was about the wheat. But now he's talking about a tree. How many of you know if the root is holy, so are the branches. We know that, right? If the root be holy. So the branches equal the Israelites. 
the branches equal the Israelite. You and I, wild olive trees, Gentiles. Wild olive trees, Gentiles. And listen at this now. We were made partakers because what happened was you took the wild branches and hooked them to a good tree. And what happened? It made us. Are y'all with me? Here we are, wild Gentiles. Y'all remember back in the, in, in the days of Jesus, they were to call the Gentiles dogs. All of that, they looked down on the Gentiles. And now all of a sudden, Jesus came and died. And when Jesus rose, the first ones to be partakers were the Gentiles. Don't count out the folk that you consider on the bottom of the totem pole. Um, I just want you to understand that we are of Abraham. We are of Abraham. Just like when Adam sinned, sin came upon mankind. Why? Because all of us were in Adam. Well, when Abraham came on the scene, all that believed were of faithful Abraham. Let's look at verse 18. It says, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou boasted not the root, but the root thee. And so what it's basically saying here is don't be arrogant. Don't be arrogant. So we don't support Abraham. Abraham support us. You remember when Jesus was talking to those in, uh, in his day? And they said, we're of Abraham. Jesus said, you of your father, the devil. They thought, because they thought, see, everything with them was flesh. Everything with them was works. He said, you're of Abraham. He said, if you had known Abraham, you'd know me. Because before Abraham was, I am. And they were so confused, the Bible said they picked up stones. Why? Because they were so proud and so boastful in who they were. We have Abraham's seed, and now you're going to come in here, and you ain't even 30 years old, and you're going to tell us before Abraham, you, you'd have lost your mind. You're the devil. He had already called them out. But, 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 but Abraham is the father of all them that believe. Romans 4. We're going somewhere with this. And so, and so the Gentile believers are linked to Abraham in one sense that we owe their salvation to him, not vice versa. Because Abraham, because he believed God and God established a covenant with him, he said the descendants like the sand and like the stars in the heaven. And it's amazing that God was talking back then, and he was talking about us back then. How many of you are thankful of that? And so this is the part of church I love. When ain't no clapping, ain't no stomping. We're learning what the word of the Lord means. So let's go to verse 19. It says, Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Since God spared not. So Gentiles, don't get high-minded and lifted up. And I promise you this, America could take a piece of this and meditate on it. As a country, we've always stood for so much, you know, in God we trust, we honor God, and now in America, you know what we've done? We're turning our back on God. Isn't it interesting that when, when God's chosen people turn their back, drowsiness came up on them. We need to be very, 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 very careful. This is a good message for America. 22 says, Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fail um, severity, but towards, but towards thee goodness. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt shall be cut off. Paul here, he summarizes his whole discussion. And, and, 
And God's sovereign choice is temporarily putting Israel aside, listen, and corporately and proclaiming righteousness by faith to all mankind. So, so, so we're talking about moral goodness and integrity here. God has declared publicly that he has put Israel into a comatose state almost to save the world. And so some people think, well, just because Jesus came, just because Jesus came. Listen, the, 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 when you look at the word, God had already chosen his people. But what happened was they rebelled against God. And so God allows certain things to happen. Let me say this to you in your personal life. Don't you begin to rebel against God. He didn't bless me, so I don't know what to do. So now I don't have time. The wrong stuff is now right, and the right stuff is now wrong because I'm popular. They know my name. And so what happens is the same thing happens over and over. When we talked in Romans 1, we talked about during this time, the Roman Empire ruled the world. Y'all know that, right? The Roman Empire ruled the world. But according to Romans 1, when you read Romans 1 about God giving them over to a reprobate mind, before a nation is taken down, Roman 1, Romans 1 happens in any nation before it's taken down. At that time in Rome, it was normal for a man to have a wife and a husband. That spirit is always unleashed in a nation before that nation is taken down. And what is going on in America now? We have made everything legally right. You can't watch good times now without a commercial coming on. And so that's why when you study the Bible in the end times, you're looking for America as a superpower and you don't see it. Lord, I forgot where I am. Oh, I got a question. Why would God have more patience with us than with the Jews? Why do we think God, because see, people have preached to us, listen, if you listen to some of our sermons, it's a buffet of desserts. Just a buffet of desserts. I don't care what you turn into something sweet. Y'all know how babies do when you give them something sweet the first time? They feet just be. We're, we're producing nothing but music that make us feel good, sermons that make us feel good, and we're not teaching rightly dividing the word. But listen, if God's patience ran out with them and God caused that to happen to them, what about us? Verse 23, and they also, if they abide not, still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. They here is Israel. When they come out of unbelief, because what does the Bible say in Romans 10, 13? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. They are coming out of that. Look at verse 24. It says, for if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which by, be by nature the branches of, be grafted? Did I read that already? No. How much more, how much more shall these, which be natural branches, be grafted in? Much more. Normally a branch of a cultivated olive tree is grafted into a wild olive tree versus a wild branch. being grafted in. So, 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 so the critical issue here is what? The destiny of Israel as declared by God himself. The destiny of Israel. What is the destiny of Israel? The destiny of Israel is that Israel is coming back in. And everything God said to them and everything he promised, they're going to be restored and God is going to get them. Now, verse 25 is critical. I need everybody to listen. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. God said, I don't want you to miss this. 
lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. They have been blinded. They've been blinded for a reason, and they've been blinded for a set time. How long are they going to be blinded? Now, isn't it interesting that the scale is going to fall off their eyes based on what happens to us? It says that the blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles. Turn to Luke chapter 19. Because I'm teaching, I feel like I want to run now. Luke chapter 19, we're going to begin at verse 38. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Because of the Jews, we got brought in. Salvation came to us. And now, because of what happens to us, they are being brought back. Verse, verse 38, saying, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees, now this is, you remember on, when they were waving the palms and Jesus was riding in? This is what we're reading. And some of the Pharisees among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Can you imagine how many sermons been preached right there with a period? Verse 41, and when he was come near, he beheld the city, Jesus, and he wept over it. Now listen to what Jesus said in verse 42. He said, if thou hast known, even thou, at least in this day, the things which belongeth unto thy peace. Jesus rode in on this donkey, Fulfill scripture. If they go back and read Daniel, they should have known Jesus was coming in. Because in Daniel chapter 9, when the angel Gabriel showed up and interrupted, interrupted Daniel's prayer, he told him Jesus was going to come riding in on that donkey, and he told them the exact number of days. And the scripture we quote in the Old Testament says, this is the day the Lord has made. That scripture is about that particular day. And when Jesus came, they didn't get it. The scripture says, so he wept over this. And then this is what he said in verse 43. Verse, verse 42 again. If thou hast known even thou, at least in this day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. Verse 43. For the days shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. He declared judgment and blindness on Israel on that day, from that day on. Wow! Here comes Scripture being fulfilled in your eyes, and you don't know the word enough to know it. So what actually happened? The fullness of the Gentiles. What is the fullness of the Gentiles? Let me tell you what the fullness of the Gentiles is. The fullness of the Gentiles is when God looks over to his son Jesus and says, go get my church. When Jesus shows up and raptures the church, that's when the scale is going to fall off their eyes. Bro, Hopkins, I feel like running. Now, isn't it interesting that Jesus, he, he told them. And if you go back and study history, within like 38 years, they came in and flattened that place. But they entered into a blindness. Let me say something to you. The worst thing in the world to do is try to make a blind person see. And there are so many people who are blind and they think they can see better than everybody. You know where you're heading? To destruction. Matthew 15, 14 says, if the blind leads the blind, they both fall into the ditch. So when he looks over and says, go get my church, 
The church is going to get raptured. I told you early on it's called the harpazo. The church is going to get raptured. Verse 26. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away unto godliness from Jacob. After the fullness of the Gentiles, when the church age is completed. Now the church started in Acts. And then the church is going to be completed. And then all of a sudden, when he, Daniel was praying in, in Daniel chapter 9, and he gave him those 70 weeks of years, when grace came, time stopped. Time stood still. And grace moved in. And the whole age of the church has been under grace. He said, I done got my church in now. And when the church is raptured up, that hourglass is going to turn over, and here come no last seven years. And don't think that the seven year is the great tribulation. The Bible says the last three and a half. Now, so Revelation is teaching there. But I need you to understand that. The partial hardening for Israel will be removed. Now, listen, when it says that every Jew, it does not mean every individual Jew. Got it? It does not mean every individual Jew. Because some folk hard just going to be hard and they're not going to believe. But, 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 the Jews, things are going to turn around for them, and their eyes are going to open. Isn't it amazing how I remember my cousin used to talk to him, witness to him, try to get him saved. Oh, he, he wasn't having it. And then when he got saved, he tried to come talk to me, and it was almost getting on my nerves. Do you know what the devil was trying to do to me while I wasn't saved? He said, man, the devil was trying to kill me. You just couldn't see. I've been doing it. I've been knowing it. This is verse 27. He says, for this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. For, the, for this judgment, God will then remove godlessness and sin from the nation, and he established his new covenant with regenerated Israel. And so I'm hoping the last part of this year, we can start a teaching on the book of Revelations. So we can understand what's going on in the book of Revelation. Because if you take the average Christian and put a $10 million check right there and say, let me ask you these seven questions, we just don't know. I want, to understand, I want you to understand. And even if you read the book of Revelations, except you study the book of Revelations, because there are certain things that happen in Revelation, it may be three chapters that are from earth to heaven's perspective. The next two chapters may be from heaven's perspective to earth. And if you don't understand and if you're not taught through it and, and study it, then you'll miss it. Let's go on. Um, verse 28. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. Listen, listen. In order for God to bring the gospel to the Gentiles, he had to deal with Israel corporately as enemies. He had to deal with them corporately as enemies. Now, who could have put together a plan like that but God? He had to deal with them corporately. And then, now think about it. If you don't understand the word and you just look at face value, they didn't turn their back on God. Now the church is shouting every Sunday. It looks like we are... No, you have to understand what the Word says. Let's look at verse number... Well, let me, let, me, let me say this. Let me say this. Again, I said it earlier. Listen, God, He loves Israel, and He's going to keep His promises. Verse 29 says this, For the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. How many times have we heard that Scripture quoted? And it's true. God doesn't change his mind. God never changed his mind on Israel. He just had to deal with them. The calling of God, then I, and, 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 and without repentance means irrevocable. God is not going to change his mind about you. Now, you may act crazy, but God never changes his mind. Amen? He doesn't revoke what he has given or to whom he has chosen. Because I wondered this. I said, God, why when Moses standing there at the burning bush, why, why you answer all those questions? You just could have got somebody else. 
before Moses was born, I chose Moses. And so sometimes we have to stand still in the presence of God until God help us see things his way. Because Moses convinced them, I ain't your guy. I got issues. Verse 30 says this, For as ye in times past have not believed God, ye have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. Even so have there also now not believed that through your mercy they may also obtain mercies. The Gentiles to whom Paul wrote were at one time disobedient. But in this age of grace, the Gentiles receive mercy. I love that. The Gentiles, they were scoundrels. But all of a sudden, God anoints one, takes one, and, and makes him who was a Jew and sent him to the Gentiles and said, you preach Jesus and him crucified to the Gentiles. And you help the Gentiles understand that they have come in through adoption and now they belong to me. I said earlier, when Adam disobeyed, all were constituted as sinners. So Israel is, 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 is now corporately disobedient to God right now. They are now corporately. But when God's mercy to the Gentile reaches its full number, the mercy for Israel is coming back on them. When we reach the full. Verse 32 says, For God had concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. God's ultimate purpose was to have mercy on all. But it's the plan that he constructed to get it done. So here are the Gentiles who were away from God. You know, the scripture says, ye who were nigh, or far, were far off, have been made nigh. Because when Jesus came on the scene, Jesus kept saying, whosoever, whosoever, according now through the Old Testament, it was the Jews only. He kept saying, get ye ready, get ready, because whosoever. And then all of a sudden, here's one out persecuting the church. He said, listen, I've called you. I've anointed you. I've put my word in your mouth. Now you go to the Jews and you tell them that my dying was for them too, because I didn't blind it, the other ones. And thanks be to God, it happened. For God had not concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon them. God's ultimate purpose again was to do justly God as he, 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 he shut up one side to bring grace to the other. And then when the time of the others has expired and he removes them, then grace is going, coming again to the Jews. That's, that's awesome. I think I need to stop there. Ooh, praise the Lord. We got about four more verses. Did y'all, were y'all blessed by the word tonight? And so now this is what I want you to do. I want you to go home, and once you've relaxed over a couple of days, I want you to go back to Facebook or YouTube, and I need you to review this and study it. It's a lot to consume, but I need you to study it. Why am I telling you to do that? Because I need you to develop a strong palate for the word. There is no scripture that's of private interpretation. But most times in our modern day settings, whenever we reach and grab a scripture, we reach and grab a scripture that sounds fitting to whatever is going on now. But tell me what was happening at that particular time because the scripture, that the calling of God is irrevocable. That's true. But how did that apply? Well, it made sense tonight because what God is saying with that scripture was, I chose the children of Israel, I chose the Jews in Abraham. And even though you see right now that there are some things seriously going on wrong with them, they're still mine. Don't let the world convince you that in your life, if things go wrong and things go bad, don't let them convince you that you don't belong to God. Because there are a lot of denominations that they, I was talking to somebody this week, they say, well, they teach us that if you sin, you're not saved no more. I said, well, how do you get saved again? 
They said, well, you do the whole thing over again. I said, well, let me ask you this. The Bible says that when you get saved, he said, I'll come. Jesus said, I'll come into you and I'll never leave you. I said, so when I get unsaved, does he leave me? They said, well, if you ain't saved, yeah, he leaves. And when you get re-saved, he comes back. Well, now, let's don't be ignorant. Let's just look at what the Bible says. And so what am I saying here as I close? When I preach, when somebody teach or preach to you, go home and study what they've said. Because so many times we get so busy amening, we don't know if it's true or not. Somebody can say, Crocodile Dundee was a... Sure enough. I want you to understand, Romans is a blessed book. You know, this is a trilogy that we're studying. So there's two other books we're going right to after that. Father, thank you for the word tonight. Thank you for every saint that's here to receive your word. And Father, I pray that our hearts and our spirits have been lifted. And Father, that we've been illuminated tonight because we better understand what your word says to us. And Father, our desire is to please you. And the better we know you, the better we can please you. So thank you for sending your word tonight. In the name of Jesus. If there's anyone here tonight who's not born again, lift up your hand. We don't want anyone to leave the house that's not born again. Would there be one tonight? Amen. Father, thank you that everybody here tonight is born again. Well, it's time to give. Amen. Praise the Lord. Left my phone in the green room. I got to do cash tonight, baby. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's get a seat out our first Wednesday night offering for 2024. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Father, tonight we bless you, praise you, and thank you for an opportunity to sow. So, Father, tonight we ask that you receive our offerings. And, Father, I just thank you for every giver tonight and every gift that you will receive, Father God, and that the work of the ministry will continue to flow out of 2545. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you hold up your seed tonight, your devices, whatever you're using to give, and repeat after me. I'm moving to a new level in my living because I'm moving to a new level in my giving. I expect nothing but the best from my God. And his best includes a threefold blessing, increase, overflow, and favor. All three are all right with me. Amen. Why don't you go ahead and sow as our ushers come tonight. Listen, let's continue praying uh, for Sister Dorothy Washington and the passing of her sister, um, Sister Minnie Dixon, um, and the passing of her sister. I had an opportunity to speak with both of them um, this evening and pray with them. Please keep them um, lifted up in prayers as they... Um, prepare and travel and do what they need to do um, this week for, for their uh, our family. So please keep them lifted up in prayer. Remember this Sunday is second Sunday and we're wearing whatever your favorite color shirt is to this week. So Dallas Cowboy blue and silver is good for this Sunday in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. So God bless you. Why don't you stand to your feet? Amen. Amen. Father, tonight, thank you so much for allowing us to be here. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for all the saints that are here. I pray your blessings down on each and every home represented here in the name of Jesus. As we leave this place, but never their presence, may your love, your grace, and your peace continue to be with us until we meet again in Jesus' name. God bless you. You are dismissed. Amen.